The Washington County Public Affairs Forum meets from 10.30 to 1 p.m. at the Old Spaghetti Factory, 18925 Northwest Tennisborn Drive, across from the Evergreen Movie Theaters in Hillsboro. The doors open at 10.30 with a first lunch serving at 11.30 and a second at noon. The program begins at noon. The forum is a neutral arena for the education of members in the public. It endorses no particular point of view and takes no responsibility for the opinions expressed by speakers, which are not necessarily the opinions of the forum, its members, or its board of directors. Programs are replayed on TVC TV. Find more information on our website. So um, right now, uh, our first speaker is uh, with uh, three minutes to speak, and that will be our Senate uh, challenger for the Senate District 14, Gary Cole. Good morning, I think it is still. No, it's afternoon. Uh, my name is Gary Cole, and I am running for the House District, uh, excuse me, Senate District 14, uh, which is uh, Sylvan, Raleigh Hills, Garden Home, south part of Beaverton, and south part of Aloha, out to 209th. I'm a 45-year uh, business owner, first-time candidate. I currently am involved in eight businesses, and we support about 100 families. When I uh, walk the district going door to door, I hand out these palm cards, and there's three bulleted items I think it's important to cover uh, today. The first one is job creation. Uh, in the 2012 February session, the House Republicans introduced seven bills designed to create about 100, uh, excuse me, 50,000 jobs uh, over the next five years. They were so enthusiastic about it, many of them wore 50K buttons on their lapels. Only one of those bills passed, and it was watered down to the point it only makes, uh, created 6,000 jobs. Now, 6,000 is good, 50,000 would have been a whole lot better. The second item on my uh, card is spending discipline. There seems to be some debate as to how many state agencies there actually are. Uh, Senator Cress Telfer from, uh, from Bend claims that there's 180 state agencies. Now, I think you'll agree with me, with 180 state agencies, there has to be some room for consolidation, elimination, and maybe privatization of some of those state functions. The third item is education funding. With the Beaverton District now going through a 30, uh, $37 million cut in uh, budget, w I think you're all aware that that's going to cost about 300 teaching positions. The answer, I don't believe, is a, is a tax levy uh, that takes years and years and years to pay off. It is creating jobs, back to my number one item. If we can create jobs, that jobs creates more uh, income, and that creates more income tax revenue to the state. So that's the answer, I believe, uh, to education funding. Now, it's not an easy task, but my belief is that we have, have to change the mix of leaders in Salem. We didn't get the job done uh, for education, and we didn't get the job done for jobs. Uh, my name is Gary Coe, Senate District 14. I appreciate your vote, and I'd appreciate your support. So I believe our next speaker will be uh, Senator Steiner. Thanks, John. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Steiner Hayward. I'm the state senator from District 17, which is northwest Portland, unincorporated Multnomah County, a large chunk of unincorporated Washington County, about a third of Beaverton, a chunk of Aloha, and a bit of Hillsborough. I was appointed to this seat at the end of December to fill the vacancy left by Suzanne Bonamici becoming our new congresswoman, and uh, really enjoyed my first term uh, first session in office, we had a remarkably successful term, uh, got some amazing bills passed. The one that I personally am the most proud of, I'm a family physician by training. I've been a family physician in Oregon for 22 years now. Um, and as a family physician, one of the reasons that I think it's appropriate and I want to stay in the Senate is because I see things from a systems perspective. And that means that we have to understand how healthcare affects education, affects jobs, affects transportation, affects the environment, and they all interact with each other. You cannot be well educated if you're not healthy. You can't have a good job if you're not well educated. 
So you need to understand how these things work together, and that's what family doctors do. So one of the bill that we passed this session that I'm the most proud of, and I was very honored as a freshman to play a key role in this, is Senate Bill 1580, which will revise how we provide care, first primarily for Medicaid patients with these coordinated care organizations. And what we'll be doing there is we'll be paying smarter, which is to say we'll be paying the right people to do the right things in the right way at the right times. Instead of making people come to their doctor's offices for care when we could be providing care over the phone or by email, will make it possible to do, to do that. Instead of saying we have to pay only for medical treatments, we'll pay for sensible things like air conditioners for people with heart failure so they don't end up in the hospital, which is a lot more expensive than a $250 air conditioner. So I was very excited to have the privilege of co-carrying that bill and helping get that bill through this session. Ultimately, my goal is to focus on three primary areas. First is health care. Every Oregonian deserves access to high quality, affordable primary health care. The second is education. Everyone in Oregon from birth to 22 deserves access to high quality public education and the services associated with that to become a well-educated citizen, a productive citizen of the state and be able to hold a good job. And the third is jobs. And there are a lot of things that come into play for that, but we need to be focused on small business development, which is something I've been working on a lot, and we passed some great bills about that last session. We need to be focused on transportation so people can get to work, and we need to not make a difference between the environment and jobs. You can protect the environment and promote business at the same time. So thank you. Check out my website, elizabethfororegon.com, and I look forward to your questions. Next, uh, we'll have uh, Representative uh, Matt Winger, House District 26. That's right, you're right on time. Hi, everyone. Uh, Matt Winger, House District 26 is uh, Wilsonville, Sherwood, Bull Mountain, and parts of rural Washington County. Yep, jumps over TV Highway, and, and when the new redistricting will grab uh, Century High School. So it's an interesting long district from south to north. Hi, Al. Uh, I've, uh, this is my second term in the House, uh, and I am the co-chair of the House Education Committee. I am very pleased that in the uh, last two sessions, we have made some pretty significant progress in trying to reform Oregon's public education system. Uh, there was a whole host of bills um, that passed in the last two years. Probably don't have time to go through the details of all of them in a three-minute opening, but uh, basically, what uh, the whole package of bills attempts to do is to give parents more choices within our public education system, to give districts more flexibility over their budgets within our public education system, and to give taxpayers more accountability for what we're actually doing with the money that we're spending within the public education system. And um, I'm also pleased that uh, um, we've been able to do some budgeting reform. I think uh, there was a certain amount of concern after the 2009 session that the legislature wasn't doing a particularly good job of holding money in reserve, budgeting for the actual two-year cycle so we wouldn't have to do across-the-board cuts later on in emergency sessions, and uh, trying to, to uh, seek uh, savings and efficiencies out of the nearly $60 billion that we spend in all funds over the two-year period. And in this last legislative session, we had the largest uh, ending fund balance that anybody can remember. Uh, and most of that ending fund balance has actually disappeared because the economic forecasts are not exactly where we would like them to be. Um, but uh, that has actually helped us prevent having to do those kinds of cuts to services that are important to to most Oregonians. Uh, lastly, I'd say the, the, one, the one part where we probably, matter of fact, I'm convinced we're not doing a good enough job at the legislature is in trying to get at the hostile business environment that unfortunately has begun to develop in Oregon. It's a reputation that uh, we don't want to have and that we should be doing everything to try to reverse. Uh, nothing that we want that's good in this state can happen without people having um, a job. Uh, whether it's all of the um, kind of social maladies that we'd like to see reduced, including hunger and domestic violence and all of the rest, but in addition to the extent that we have to provide services to folks who are vulnerable and need those kinds of things, we have to have most Oregonians working and working productively in order to generate the tax revenue that will actually pay for those safety net programs for folks. 
So uh, I hope that we'll see some improvement going forward. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully when we get into Q&A, we'll get to talk about some of the ways that we can actually get at that problem. But uh, I appreciate you all being here today and listening to me. And um, um, I'd ask for your vote in, uh, in both in the May primary and in November. Thank you. Now it's time to hear from uh, House District uh, 27 Representative Tobias Reed. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. I really appreciate your ongoing efforts to uh, facilitate good discussion about public policy. I'm Tobias Reed. I have the honor of representing House District 27, which goes from Raleigh Hills to Murray Hill, essentially. Uh, I've been in the legislature for a few years now. And outside of the legislature, I work at Nike in product development. It doesn't necessarily sound like it's all that relevant, but it turns out there are some significant similarities. Uh, at Nike, we work on footwear products, uh, and in order to deliver a successful product, we have to make a lot of trade-offs. We have to prioritize and try to deliver on time. That's something that I try to take to the legislature. And three minutes, of course, is not very long to talk about the whole host of issues that are relevant. So I want to focus on two things that are related to economic development and job creation. Uh, in the last session, I was very proud to play a role in the passage of the Oregon Investment Act uh, that sets the stage for a process that will streamline and centralize our economic development activities around the state. We found in uh, traveling the state and listening to business leaders and entrepreneurs uh, that the thing that really is holding them back, it's preventing them from expanding their businesses and hiring Oregonians is access to credit. That's different in different parts of the state, but a significant and consistent theme was that our economic development programs are too scattered, not flexible enough, and not coordinated enough. So the Oregon Investment Act uh, sets a stage for improving that along flexibility, coordination, and leverage, bringing more additional dollars, uh, private sector dollars, into the state. The second is the Oregon Innovation Council. I've been a fan and an advocate for the uh, Innovation Council since before I joined the legislature, and it's important that everyone here knows about it. By better connecting the commercialization, research and development, innovation activities that happen in our colleges and universities with industry, we're able to solve problems for existing businesses, help them be more competitive, and to create new technologies, new industries, and new jobs. It's one of the most effective things we do as a state. For every dollar that Oregon invests in the Innovation Council and its uh, initiatives, we're able to bring in more than seven dollars uh, of external sources of, uh, of money. Uh, even in the short time that it has existed, uh, it has created and retained thousands of jobs. Those two things, I think, are examples of the approach I try to bring to the legislature, a long-run focus and building on the competitive advantages that Oregon has. We have a great story to tell. We're doing great things. And we need to continue that long-run focus uh, for the future. I appreciate your support and vote and look forward to your questions. Thanks. <laughs> And now uh, from uh, a brand new House uh, District to Washington County, House District 24, Kathy Thompson. Campbell. Campbell, excuse me. Excuse <laughs> okay. me. I'm sorry. I'm Kathy Campbell. Okay. Um, I am running for state rep for House District 24, which is kind of a newly redistricted area. And so it runs from the south part of Hillsboro down through McMinnville and all through the wine country. Beautiful area. So I have the privilege of um, going to be the representative for there. In addition to that, I'm a mother. I have a 17-year-old in the high school public education area. I'm a daughter. I have an 86-year-old father living with me. I'm a wife, and I have a husband, which comes with a mortgage. Um, I'm a small business owner, and I'm the vice president for our church. And in addition to that, I have been working the last few years um, raising money for our high school. We've raised over 20000 for the music programs. I have worked with Habitat to help build two homes in the McMinnville area. I've worked on programs for YCAP and the St. Barnabas Soup Kitchen. I can juggle a lot and I've got a lot of experience a lot and I'm looking forward to taking all of that with me to Salem. None of that disappears when I go there. Those are going to be the things that are important to me. Education, healthcare, small businesses. And I'm excited about what's going to be new that I'm not even thinking about that I'm going to be able to do down there. And you hit the head on the nail when you said that our health care that we did press and open up for more kids in our communities are going to be diagnosed and have health care at an earlier point in their life. 
and they're not gonna end up in high school now being found out that they have a mental disability and they've pushed under the carpet and nobody's taking care of them. So I'm really a proponent for that, to keep pushing those. Um, VoteKathyCampbell com has more information about myself and is also hooked up to take donations online. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I uh, would like to get back into order. I seem to have a little trouble following the, order, the correct order. Uh, now it's House District 28. Uh, please welcome Representative Jeff Barker. <laughs> Thank you for being here today, and thank you for allowing me to be here today as well. My name is Jeff Barker, and I'm the state rep from District 28, which is Aloha, portions of Aloha in Beaverton. I was elected in 2002, and it's been an honor to serve that community since that time. Prior to running for office, I had a 31-year career in law enforcement. I started with the Oregon State Police and uh, finished most of my the 26 years with the City of Portland Police, where I retired as a lieutenant in 2001. My wife Vicki and I have been married for 46 years. Uh, we have two adult daughters. One is a uh, prosecutor, a deputy district attorney in Multnomah County, and my other daughter is a journeyman electrician with IBEW Local 48, and she's a project manager out on the uh, new uh, Intel uh, fab they're working on. And I have one grandson, which I'm very proud of. I grew up in Portland in the Westmoreland community. I attended Benson High School, and out of high school I joined the Marines. Part of the bringing up in my family was that part of the male's transition into manhood was you served your country, so I uh, did a hitch in the Marines. Uh, my dad died while I was gone, and then I came back and helped my mom out a bit and uh, got married and went on to Portland State where I graduated with a degree in history. My wife and I moved to Lowell in 1978 so that our kids could go to Beaverton schools. We believed that was a really good school, where that they were really good schools, and they were. And they got a great... Uh, educational opportunities, and I want to continue that for people in the future. Because of my background, I ended up being uh, more or less channeled into uh, the Judiciary Committee down in Salem. But I, that being said, I want to say that I understand that investment in education is a lot cheaper than investment in prisons later, and that's uh, really important. But I'm proud to help keeping families safe in Oregon. I. Uh, been chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I've served on it, been the chairman and also been the co-chairman. And I worked very hard to keep repeat drunk drivers off the road, to prevent deaths and injuries. Um, I've worked with many lawyers in that, in that committee for both civil and criminal law, that we've worked on countless bills to do that. And I've worked hard on domestic violence and uh, sexual violence and, and human trafficking. If we elected, I want to expand access to Oregonians with Oregon health care and the amount of uh, aid available for students for community college and the colleges. I think community colleges are vitally important, as you can see, see from my two daughters. One went through on through law school, the other one took a trade uh, route. Both are very valuable, and I, I really support having that done. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, our next candidate will be from House District 30, Adriana Connors. Hello, um, my name is Adriana Cañas, and I am running for House District 30. I am the youngest of seven children, parents who immigrated here over 60 years ago on what the world looked upon as the promise of America. My mother from Mexico and my father from Ecuador, they met in 1957 at Roosevelt High School in East Los Angeles. Soon they were married and with two young children, my father picked up a job as a milk delivery man. And on that salary, he was able to purchase a home, the home that my, parent, my family still lives in today. My parents worked very hard. My father delivered milk by day and went to school at night to learn to become a refrigeration and air conditioning technician. They taught us to value education, that through hard work and sacrifice, we too would achieve the American dream, just as they had. I am running because I feel the promise of America slipping away. No longer can one a family purchase a home on one salary, and one parent can choose to stay home and rear their children. 
I know the realities that Oregon families are facing because there are realities. My husband and I have always worked hard balancing family, work, and school. We have both worked full time and we have always paid more than half of my check to childcare. And yet, as many Oregonians, one in four to be exact, we have faced bankruptcy and we have paid every single penny back. There is a huge disconnect in Salem. Salem needs real people like me. People who live the realities that Oregonians are facing today. They need to hear my story. They need to hear the stories of our community. When I get to Salem, because I will be there soon, I will end the divisiveness just as I have on the Hillsboro School Board for the past three years. I will be, bring people together by building strong relationships and real relationships to tackle our real problems that continue to squeeze away at our middle class and allow our promise of America to slip away. I will win because I'm a stark contrast to my opponent. He's a politician and I am not. I'm a mother, a school board member. I am a mother and a school board member and someone who cares deeply for her community. I have worked for the past five years with Hillsborough's 2020 vision and was named the outstanding individual for the Hillsborough 2020 vision. So I want to thank you for allowing me to speak today. And I know that you all know that we need real people in Salem, real people like me, who will work together to keep our promise of America alive. And we will together achieve our American dreams. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adriana. And then also our next um, our next um, speaker will be from House of Street 35, Representative Margaret Doherty. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and see all of you on, on such a lovely day. Um, I am Margaret Doherty, and I'm the current state representative in House District 35, which is all of Greater Tigard and a little bit of uh, Southwest Portland. And, we're, and with the new districting, I'm also going into Garden Home now. So um, it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here, and it's an honor and a pleasure to represent the people in Tigard. A little bit about myself. I pretty much was raised in, in Portland. My father was in the military for 30 years, and he retired here in Portland. Um, went to Wilson High School in Portland State. And uh, when I graduated, I became a teacher at Milwaukee. Actually, I was a teacher at Beaverton High School for a year and then spent the next 11 years uh, teaching at Milwaukee High School. Uh, I left in 2000 or in uh, 1984 and went to work for the Oregon Education Association as a labor negotiator. So being a labor negotiator for almost 30 years, it, it helps you down in Salem to be able to see the middle of things and uh, to see that there are compromises and to see that, that, that if you don't work together on certain issues, nothing gets done. And so that's a talent that uh, I've, I've used very much. I think another thing that's kind of interesting about me is when I worked for the Oregon Education Association, I not only had what we would consider more of the, of the urban areas, I represented like the Tiger Teachers, McMinnville Teachers, Lake Oswego, Hillsborough, Gaston, Forest Grove, Banks, but I also spent about 10 years on the Columbia River Gorge and saw more of the rural areas of Oregon. And I saw what the effects were um, when a mill closed down in Maupin. And I saw what the effects were when some of the environmental issues that came up uh, affected the people in, in um, uh, Hood River. So I've got that kind of urban rural perspective and have seen um, how it affects Oregonians. And I think that's another thing that's very, very good to bring to, to Oregon and to the, bring to the legislature. But not only that, I have also am very active in my own community. I've lived in Tigard for over 20 years. I've volunteered to the library almost 15 and one of the things I've, I've been doing for the past couple of years is dealing with the peer court. And I'm like the warden at the library for the peer court students that have been uh, sent there to do community service. I'm on the Tiger Planning Commission and have been on the Tiger Planning Commission since about 2007. And so I'm active in my community and uh, realize that not, not that the rest of you don't live in wonderful communities, but I think Tiger's the best that we've got in Washington County. While I've been in the legislature, I was appointed in, in August of 2009, so I've gone through three sessions. And one of the things that I'm really proud of is the Oregon Business Development Fund. Myself and Senator Bonamici, now Congresswoman Bonamici, uh, in the very first uh, session I was down there, 
increase the oregon business development fund which in the long run created about three hundred jobs and helped about forty businesses in oregon in the second session we expanded that i've dealt with veterans issues especially house bill thirty five hundred which gives the military department in oregon more leeway to go through and work with trying to deal with the military cultural barriers especially with uh, um, some of the issues that that uh, iraqi uh, veterans and afghani veterans are coming back with so i bring some moderation to the legislature i bring experience of bringing people together and bringing people to the middle and i also bring the experience of urban and rural so thank you very much and i look forward to your questions Thank you, and uh, now we have a House District 37, uh, Julie Parrish. Thank you. I'm Julie Parrish. I represent House District 37, which is Westland, Tualatin, and Durham, Stafford, a little bit of Lake Oswego. Um, I want to tell you a tale of two legislatures. Um, in 2010, voters in Oregon tied our house. Voters in Virginia tied their house. And a recent newspaper article talked about the ties and the difference between the two states. And what they said was that Oregon was productive and we got the work done for our citizens and Virginia imploded. That's the difference, I think, about people in Oregon working for Oregonians uh, when you come together to solve problems. And I want to share a personal example of a bill that I co-sponsored with someone across the aisle from me. She lives across the river from me in Milwaukee. House Bill 3536 is a bill that um, we passed in our Human Services Committee and uh, essentially what that bill does is it helps people who are coming out of our prison system continue access to the mental health care that they start receiving in our, in our prison system. Governor signed that bill on June 1st and of course all the new kids were told, you know, don't expect the governor to sign your bills. You're all new and, you know, you're all Republicans and so governor's not going to do that. But he signed that bill June 1st. It was the first bill I ever passed. 19 days later, the Multnomah County Coroner's Office called me and said that my sister had died of a drug addiction. She had been in our prison system. She had been in uh, Coffee Creek. She had been at Washington County Jail. And mental health and, and drug addiction took her life. So that bill's not going to help her, but it's going to help a lot of people who come in and out of our prison system. Folks, these are the everyday problems that everyday Oregonians face. And those are the things that we were able to go to Salem this year, work together across the aisle, and solve in this last legislative session. I'm pleased to have been a part of that group that listened to people, that cared about people, that looked at the problems facing Oregon, and found ways to come together and solve them. Now, do we agree on everything all the time? Absolutely not. Uh, my husband just finished up a, almost a 23-year career in the military upholding our rights to have civil discourse. So I'm, even in the, some of the discourse we have, I'm, I'm pleased with the outcome of the legislation we passed because I believe that the everyday Oregonian this session was the winner. And it's been a long time since everyday Oregonians win. Now I came to this forum last cycle, asked for votes from people in my community, and I shared a story about my grandmother being one of the presidents of the sons and daughters of the Oregon pioneers. We were from pioneer stock, pioneers or doers. And in this last legislative session, we did. We got the work done. We solved our budget problems. We rebalanced the budget. We took on health care reform. And we did education reform in a way that hasn't been done in a long time. So I'm going to ask the voters in my district to send me back for another term. You know, as a mother and a business owner and an active communi community member, I think it's just important that we have a variety of voices because it is a citizen's legislature. And as such, it takes a variety of voices to get the work done and truly represent all the people of Oregon. So thank you for your time today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Julie. And now it is time to move on to our Q&A. And uh, I'm sure we've had some really good experience. Before we do our Q&A, let's give all of them a really big hand because they have brought some really good information to us. For ourselves, for a member, one thing that's concerned me a great deal in the last few years is the attitude of what we call tax expenditures or tax credits, which takes away money from our general fund, which they better use for education. And I compare this to bribery. We pay somebody or a company to come to our state or our locality, but that is general fund money and I don't see the difference between tax credits, tax expenditure, 
and plain old bribery, your reactions. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, I, I instead look at uh, not tax credits, but um, well, I forgot what it's called. Uh, when when we have um, not even incentives. It's uh, you ever forget a word and you can't can't, can't bring that word to you. Darn. Well, it's, uh, it's when we uh, give uh, companies uh, subsidies. That's it, subsidies. We have subsidized so many um, uh, businesses, uh, and particularly uh, some of the green energy businesses that uh, maybe never will come around. Uh, my favorite example is the uh, windmills, that not only are they, uh, have we subsidized the uh, creation of the windmills, but also now Bonneville Power is uh, required to pay them to not produce electricity. And uh, so overall subsidies are not something that uh, I'm in favor of. There may be exceptions that I'm not realizing, but uh, um, that's where I'm at. Thanks for your question. I think we need to look very carefully at our overall tax policy. And certainly the issue of tax expenditures, tax credits, subsidies, all those sorts of things have to be examined as part of that overall review of our entire tax code. My sense is that tax credits, when applied properly for very short periods of time to promote the kinds of business development or other issues that we want to have happen, make some sense. But they need to be sunsetted, they need to be short-lived, and they need to be very targeted. Tax expenditures are another issue altogether, and many of those are out of our control. Many of those relate to the federal government, so we don't have a lot of control on that one. But our code overall, is sloppy, there are too many loopholes, it's inconsistent across the board. You can have two companies with the same kinds of revenues, the same kinds of net profits, paying very different amounts of taxes. Our property tax system is a shambles and needs to be considered, reconsidered. So all of those issues play into what you're saying. I don't think we can throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we need to take a hard look at all of these issues. You know, the one, one thing I found out in the two and a half years that I've been in the legislature is that you really need to look at everything. And I think this was a good question that the gentleman asked. And to, so to go through and look at loopholes, to look at a lot of the, uh, of the loopholes that they have, uh, hundreds and hundreds of them in the Oregon State Tax Code uh, is something that I think is a very, very prudent thing to do. Sometimes with incentives, though, to business, sometimes those incentives bring in business. And I think a good example of that is here in Washington County. I mean, some of the incentives that have been given to Intel and to uh, Sequent, to TriQuint, and some of the, the business that have brought in have brought in thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs. So I think what you do is you look at every tax situation, you look at what the overall effect is, what brings in business, what doesn't bring in business, what is uh, something that is, is helpful to all Oregonians, and then uh, take it from there. Thank you. I think Margaret just answered the question for me. As the new kid, I'm going to be asking questions. That's going to be my job, and that's what I'm going to be expected to do. I love being the devil's advocate. That's one of my favorite things to say, but why? Why are we doing this? Um, and so that's the things that I'm going to be looking at and saying, but why? Thanks for the question, Mr. So since I, uh, I've been on the Revenue Committee uh, since I got to the legislature, and I can imagine uh, very few things more fun than talking about revenue and tax expenditures, expenditures generally. That probably makes you all think I'm a little bit crazy, but this is important stuff. The thing, first thing to remember is that tax credits are a subset of tax expenditures, and I'm happy to report that in 2009 we passed the bill in the legislature, and it is now law, that put sunset uh, clauses on every one of the existing tax credits. And we're going through the process in the Revenue Committee. Each session, we take a chunk of the tax credits and review them. If the legislature does nothing, those tax credits end. And we have taken action in some cases to modify, extend, improve, otherwise change those tax credits based on our best judgment about whether or not they're effective. The challenge with economic development and tax structures generally, particularly when it relates to economic development, is there's almost no way to know with any precision, even in retrospect, was that incentive the thing that made the difference did we send money that was not necessary, or are we just short of another great deal? So we have to continue with that very specific 
uh, rigorous scrutiny to make sure that we're doing the best we can. So the government does that so it can pick winners and losers, and uh, your politicians and elected officials can decide which businesses they prefer and which ones they don't, and try to incentivize them that way. And uh, I think the history of the, most of this is pretty dubious when it comes to that kind of, of subsidy. Uh, sometimes it's called crony capitalism. Uh, generally, it's not a good idea. But let me tell you a tale of uh, two different types of subsidies that I've experienced in the two terms that I've been in. From the day I walked in the building, I have opposed the business energy tax credit system, which was essentially subsidizing uh, the building of windmills and solar panels around the state. None of it really penciled out. We were giving away an extraordinary amount of tax revenue for very little in the way of job creation, and frankly, the energy wasn't necessarily competitive as well. Uh, the estimates on what that was, uh, what that what that subsidy w amounted to in lost revenue were grossly underestimated, at say 20, 30, 40 million dollars. And it ended up being a billion dollars, a billion dollars that did not come in to state tax coffers because of that program. I'm happy it's been mostly reduced. On the flip side, a really tiny one, Oregon maintains a research and development tax credit. Very small, just a couple million dollars. That was in jeopardy of being uh, eliminated for businesses in Oregon. Oregon would have been the only state in the union that didn't have a research and de development tax credit and could very well have added to this business unfriendliness issue that I've been trying to talk about, uh, about Oregon being competitive in attracting businesses and retaining businesses here. My response is pretty simple. It's um, show me the jobs and I'll show you the tax credit. Um, my husband works for a company that moved us out here over 17 years ago and that's Intel. Intel did receive some incentives and Intel has done some amazing work in our community. My district is and holds the Silicon Forest. So this is something that I'm gonna work hard on doing and making clear that if there's incentives to be had, you will create livable wage jobs not create another continuous working poor. We cannot have that, okay? So I value what Intel has done, allowed my husband to start the Intel Latino Network in 1998 and be one of the founders of the 4-H tech wizards of Intel, of which who have over 500 students who have graduated that program. So thank you. So my business partner lives in another state and they've got a very different tax structure than Oregon and frankly they're a lot more prosperous than Oregon. They have all the same rural concerns that we have and yet they have much lower unemployment. They are taking good care of their folks. They are doing things like autism services for young children. Um, it, they just It's a different scenario. So I think you know, Governor Kitzhopper is very interested in looking at tax reform. It's not going to be a one-term conversation. It's going to have to stretch over multiple terms because it's so complicated. In the short term, though, we can do things like reducing non-essential non spending expenditures so that we can send those dollars to frontline services. A perfect example, the Oregonian did a, a, a piece about how much money we spend on advertising. 50 plus million dollars a year. I, I don't need a billboard to tell me that the lottery does good things, but we spend $10 million a year at the lottery doing that when those dollars could go to schools or they could go to frontline services. So I'm very interested in tax reform that, it, that helps. Right now, Oregon also has one of the highest tax rates for the lowest income families. We need to fix that. Um, so I'm interested in that conversation with the governor and it, you know, it, it needs to be fixed, but we have to do something so that we can have a more prosperous state. Oregon ranks as one of the least prosperous states, um, you know, based on our taxation issues. Being ninth, I don't have a whole lot left to say here. It's pretty much been said, but, uh, it is important. And I, I agree with, uh, Representative Wingert about the crony capitalism. It's difficult when one group or another is picking winners and losers, and, and it depends who's in control of the legislature, and that doesn't work well, as we've seen in certain many examples. It helps sometimes. Uh, we do need a complete tax overhaul, and I was hoping when we were at 30 30, we would take a real shot at that, where we'd have a real compromise to work with, but we didn't get that done this time. So it'll continue. We, as uh, Representative Reed mentioned, every uh, 
year we're going to take or every session we're going to take a look at one third of the tax loopholes the tax credits and see if they're still worthwhile keeping and if they're not we're going to get rid of them so thank you I'll make this a little different. Uh, candidates, uh, first, thanks for being here. My name's Eric, and uh, I'm a forum member. Urban Unincorporated uh, Washington County exports their franchise fees from their utility bills to Urban Incorporated Washington County. So without each of you answering the question, I'd just like a show of hands from you of who has a legislative solution to this tax inequity. No hands? <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I'd have to know a whole lot more about it to be able to answer that, and I don't. All right, just your question. That was pretty easy. Go ahead. Patrick Whaler, former member. Um, to create jobs and high paying jobs, we need a strong university system. The university system's been cut, cut, cut. And I'd like to hear your comments on what it is, you know, what should, needs to be done. And also, uh, do we need some consolidation on our higher education yeah. universities? Yeah, okay, thank you, Very excellent question. We do need consolidation. We've got boards all over the place, and they're talking about doing some of that, also making some of the boards independent, as University of Oregon started to do, the president lost his job. There's been some movement to combine Portland State University with Oregon Health Sciences University to make a major uh, uh, research facility, which I think would help a lot if we could do that. It is, it, as we all know, college is going, expenses for the students are going through the roof. They're making it very difficult for kids to go to school these days and come out without owing, you know, starting out with a huge mortgage on their back. So uh, there's a lot of things to be done there, but consolidation would be a good point, starting point. Thank you. So um, I'm neither Beaver nor Duck. I went to Southern Oregon University. Uh, so I appreciate the value of our small schools. I would not be in favor of consolidation, but I do want to see that our small Eastern, Western, Southern um, are strong university choices here in our state um, because it's not all OSU and University of Oregon. And those small schools bring a flair and flavor that sometimes you don't get at a big school. Um, as in terms of higher education and what we can be doing, I mean, I think we want to have programs that turn out uh, folks who can have high wage level jobs. We want to get people enrolled in school, but we also need to recognize that everybody is going to go to a four-year university. So that means we also need to look at higher ed from a career technical perspective, uh, look at also what we can do for support our community colleges. I went to PCC, so I've been kind of through all of our university system in one way, shape, or form. Um, you know, but one of the other things that, that I think is we also need to try to do a better job in our university system of the degrees we confer on folks and, and match them with the job market. Uh, we only have one state archaeologist. Uh, so we need to, you know, look at engineering programs, healthcare fields, the places where that our jobs are growing and find ways to connect students into those professions so that we have a strong job market. I want to first share that I'm a product of a community college, then a four-year university degree. Um, education is the heart, and it's the soul of the nation, of the future of our nation. Um, I have quite a few concerns. One story that I was shared by a gentleman that came to volunteer on my campaign who moved back into my district, never thought about this. He said, we did everything that our parents and our teachers told us to do. We did good in school. We got our 3.8s and above. We got accepted to four-year universities. Our parents saved money. They paid. We took out uh, loans. We took out everything. And now I have my degree, and I come back home, and I'm supposed to create my own job. I was looking for a job that I would be hired straight as, as, as a college graduate. Now I have to create my own job. So if I had known that, I would have maybe taken all the money that invested into my education and used it to invest in my own business. And this was a huge eye-opener for me. I had not thought about this. And these are the things that we need to discuss. We also need to discuss our private colleges who have federal funding and aren't turning out the outcomes and placing our students into jobs and being accountable for that. So I think this is a huge thing we really need to look at. Thank you. Well, higher education has become almost cost prohibitive. 
Uh, it, it's got a cost escalation problem in the, the same way that health care does. Subsidies have a lot to do with that. I'm not sure that how we turn that train around uh, quickly. The other problem we have is we have very little connection between the money that we spent and outcomes that we ask for. So the universities aren't held accountable for the types of degrees they give or whether or not people are fully employed in that occupation that they got the degree in and whether or not their debt to income ratio makes any sense. These questions almost don't get asked at all. Uh, community colleges are a lot different. Uh, you know, in some ways they're much more responsive to uh, what the job market is and uh, we could learn a lot from watching how that system has evolved over the last few decades. Um, I, but I think we also need to seriously consider how we push that whole idea and concept down even into our high schools. Are we, are we thinking about when we've got high school students whether or not the high school they're attending is really connecting them to where they want to be? Uh, right now these systems are very, very siloed and part of the reforms that we're in the process of working on over the next couple of years is trying to make those all connect with each other and start having those conversations. Trying to think about how to how to answer this in the right way because there's so many aspects of, of this uh, of this question. First thing is I, I really enjoy asking people what they think the largest institution of higher education in Oregon is. People often answer University of Oregon or Oregon State. The answer, of course, is if you start to if you combine Oregon State, University of Oregon, Portland State, you start to get in the neighborhood uh, of Portland Community College. The lesson of that, of course, is that we need a full range of higher education options that work for all sorts of people. Uh, look to the, to the one state to the north of us and look at the differences in our per capita income between those two states. It's significant and one of the main differences is the fact that the state of Washington has a much larger number of college graduates. Uh, it's one of the, the keys to, to success. But there is also a tension whether we need to respond to merely to the, the needs of industry uh, or to create and help create uh, engaged, skilled citizens. Uh, one of my former bosses, uh, Treasury Secretary Summers, used to tell a story about the, um, the importance of research into imaginary numbers. These are the square roots of negative numbers. Doesn't seem very interesting, but it eventually leads to radar and to two-way radio. So we have to have a role for the fundamental kind of research that we haven't yet identified its outcome. Uh, finally, working with the Treasurer on the opportunity to use some upcoming bonding capacity to fully fund the Oregon Opportunity Grant and increase access. Uh, I believe we definitely have to give the children of tomorrow the education that they deserve. I want my child to be able to stand up here in a few years and be able to do this. And I want the children educated that are going to be determining what they're going to do with my Medicare in a few years. But meanwhile, I think we're doing a disservice to a lot of our children by telling them you have to have a four-year degree. If a child wants to be a mechanic or a plumber or an engineer, We've just totally, I think, lost those children. And we're not saying, yes, you can do that, and it's fine. And so and I believe that we're going to have to relook at our training programs and our community colleges and definitely put those programs back into play. Yeah. One minute for your three bucks on this question. Your 30 seconds each if you want to Very quickly, you need to look at the funding of higher ed. All of us were able to go to college because it was very inexpensive. It was doable. We could go. We could work our way through college, which I did at Portland State. And the reason is, is that so much more of the money has been shifted from higher ed to K-12 education. So we also need to look at the entire funding of higher education and, and post-secondary. So we're talking everything from trade programs to community colleges to universities. Thanks. Um, I would say several things. First, we've got to support the community colleges better. In particular, we have to look at these wonderful programs now like Running Start or Future Connect in Portland, which allow high school students to get college credit. We've got the Great Oregon Transfer Degree, which is well established, which lets students get their first two years out of the way at community colleges, which are much less expensive. We have to look at the entire funding system. I talked about education from birth to 22. We cannot look at higher ed separately from everything that happens from the day you're born until you hit college, because it's all part of a continuum. We've got the governor's 40-40-20 plan, which I agree completely. We have to be able to train our mechanics, our HVAC techs, uh, all the people who need those technical degrees. So we need to understand higher education from a much broader perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Candice. This all ends at um, 1 o'clock for I mean, an hour period of time for the television. So I'll just say this is the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. I think our hour is completed, so I don't know if we have any more media time. But I'd like to thank the candidates for being here. As usual, if someone wants to stick around, we'll continue the dialogue. 
and Don will, I mean, uh, John will be um, refereeing that. So thank you, everyone. And I guess we're signing off.